Hello, everyone. Welcome to our current edition of EVBOX webinars. In this segment, we will discuss utility EVS -E infrastructure implementation featuring PG&E's Electric Vehicle Charging Network Program, EVCN, for AC L2 charging and PG&E's EV Fast Charge Program for DC Fast Charging. Both programs aim to maximize the, ins uh, the installation of EV charging infrastructure in order to accelerate EV adoption, but they are different in scope and scale. We will hear how PG&E is growing stronger from challenges and a dedication to continuous improvement. Of special interest to me are the discussions on program soft costs and the ways that PG&E is minimizing their impact. With that said, I'm very pleased to introduce two experienced and knowledgeable panelists, Meredith Morford and Sam Pyle. Meredith is a supervisor in PG&E's Clean Energy Transportation Group and has supported transportation electrification programs as well as vehicle to grid integration efforts. In her 12 years in the utility industry, she is most proud to be part of the work PG&E is doing as an incubator of the development of EV infrastructure deploy deployment and the opportunity she has to employ her passion for continuous process improvement. Sam is a program manager in PG&E's Clean Energy Transportation Organization. For the past year, Sam has been leading the de deployment of PG&E's EV Fast Charge Program, which we'll be hearing about more later in, in the program. Prior to this, she worked in PG&E's grid innovation and demand response teams, where she played various roles, advancing field demonstrations of technologies to enable communication and control of assets on both sides of the meter. Prior to joining PG&E, Sam spent many years working for business and energy efficiency consultancies. Without further ado, please join me in a warm welcome to both Meredith and Sam, and I will hand over the presentation to Meredith to explore PG&E's EVCN program. Thank you, Diana, and thank you for the invitation to be here today. We're certainly excited to share about our programs. We'll talk today about Pacific Gas and Electric, our clean energy transportation programs. I'll give you all an overview of the PG&E territory and some context for size and scope. I'll share with you our EBCN overview, achievements, and learnings, and then I'll hand it over to Sam to talk about how we're using those learnings on the EV Fast Charge program. And as Diana said, we'll do a little Q&A discussion, and if you have any um, chat questions, we'll address those. So before we start, we're gonna do a little poll to see how savvy and knowledge you are, knowledgeable you are about Pacific Gas and Electric Company. So if you could choose one of these radio buttons, which of the following PG, PG statistics is true? Are we number one in the United States for the number of electric vehicles, the number of solar customers, the number of behind the meter battery storage deployments or all of the above? You guys did really well, wow. Uh, all of the above was the correct answer. And we'll, we'll chat more about those stats on the next slide. So this is a little bit um, of information about PG&E. So we're focused on providing safe, reliable, affordable, and clean energy to, to nearly 16 million Californians. You can see our territory in color overlaid on the map of California there. We have about 20, a little over 20,000 employees. We serve 70,000 square miles in our service territory. We have 5.3 million electric customers and 4.4 million gas customers. Um, on the right, some more statistics, and these are what we're in the poll for you all. We are ranked number one with 20% of all U.S. rooftop solars. We have 450,000 solar customers in our territory, uh, 270,000 electric vehicles in our service territory. That's 20% of all electric vehicles in the United States. 
greater than 800 gigawatt hours of efficiency savings. That ranks us number two among US utilities. And 7,500 behind the meter battery customer sites, which ranks us number one for battery behind the meter storage deployments, which is about half of all US deployments. So if you see on the map and you think of that in relation to the size of the US, we've got um, both at pg e and then certainly our customers are helping us lead the way. So we'll move on to the next slide and talk a little bit more about um, our investments at pg e in electric vehicle infrastructure. So the last slide covered more um, of our broad portfolio of um, clean energy at the company. And these are three programs in particular that we're focused on for EV infrastructure. So the common um, consistent features among all three is that they're focused on make ready infrastructure. Um, if you think about that in that um, in the context of what infrastructure look like, we call it from the pole um, all the way to the meter and then in some programs all the way to the charging station. So the EV charge network program is what I'll talk to you most about today and our um, learnings and our achievements is a hundred and thirty million dollar program over three years. Um, 7,500 level two chargers and we were aiming at workplaces and multi-unit dwellings in that program. Our EV fleet program is up and running. It's a $236 million program over five years. And we're looking to electrify 6,500 medium and heavy duty fleet vehicles at, a, at 700 sites around our service ter territory. And our EV fast charge program, which Sam spearheads for us and she'll talk to you more about today, is an order of magnitude less, $22 million, small but mighty, over five years. And that's really focused on make ready infrastructure for fast charging plazas. We'll go on to um, EBC and overview. So there's a lot to know. Um, so we'll do a crash course just to baseline here. Um, like I said earlier, it's a three-year three, three -year program that's started in 2018, so we're looking to wrap up um, in this year. We'll also talk in discussion a little bit about what impact COVID has had on our timeline. $130 million budget, so the scale in our approved decision by the CPUC was to electrify up to 7,500 level two chargers. Um, we are gauging 500 to 750 sites. We were really focused um, on putting those chargers only at multi-unit dwellings. I'll probably slip and call them MUDs a lot uh, throughout this presentation and workplaces as well. And if, if you think about it, um, level two, think about how long a level two charger takes to charge a car. Um, that makes sense to cite them at multi-unit dwellings and workplaces for how long you're spending at a residence or your workplace. Um, pairing that with a level two charge program made a lot of sense. Unique to PG&E um, amongst the other utility companies in California that had similar decisions for electric transportation infrastructure programs, um, PG&E owns, um, can own up to 35% of the chargers. Um, and so we really focused our time on, in MUDs and at DACs, disadvantaged communities, um, trying to incentivize and put more chargers into the multi-unit dwellings in disadvantaged community areas. So in particular, since we were focused on um, incentivizing those, we have targets as well. So 20%, we were looking to have 20% of those chargers cited at multi-unit dwellings with a stretch goal of 30% and 15% in disadvantaged communities with a stretch goal of 35%. So disadvantaged communities, again, just to baseline, um, is a definition by Cal and Virus Screen, and it includes things like um, air emissions as well as economic factors. So we'll move on to some achievements so I can brag a little bit. We're almost at the tail end of the program, um, so I'll share with you accomplishments today. No secrets here. All of this information you can find on our website, pg&e.com, and this information is from our Q1 report. Um, link to the source there for you if you're interested in looking at this data or any other data that comes out in our quarterly reports. 
So these are three different ways to slice the same data. So the total number of ports we're installing, if you add these three sections up, is just shy of 5,000. So that middle column, 4,932 ports we're installing. So I split it up for you here um, to show of those 4,932 ports, how many are going owner versus sponsor model. So we had, we gave, um, Mo the MUDs and DACs, uh, the option for pg e to own and maintain and operate the charging stations or if the customers wanted to do that their own. So pg e owned is the top line and then sponsor numbers the second line. You could also slice this data since it was important for us to analyze it a different way between multi-unit dwellings and workplaces. And you can see the split there for how, um, how many ports were, went into MUDs and workplaces as well as the number of sites. So if you remember from the last slide, our target for multi-unit dwellings was 20% of the ports to be sited in multi-unit dwellings. And we actually, our stretch goal is 30%. And we actually, um, achieved 38%. So by both standards, we blew that number out of the water. And then the last slice of data is a way to look at the same number of ports, the same number of sites, but differentiating between disadvantaged communities and non-disadvantaged communities. And again, we had a goal there to cite 15% of the charging ports in disadvantaged communities with a stretch goal of 35, and we overachieved um, and were able to cite 38% of our charging stations in disadvantaged communities. So we're pretty excited about that. So the, the bottom line there activated to date to give you an idea of the nearly 5,000 that we um, have signed contracts for and we're going to place for this program, we've installed 2,912 at 119 unique sites. So a lot of numbers, I think the takeaways here are that um, the, the things that we're proud of certainly are nearly, we're going to install nearly 5,000 ports with this program. We blew out of the water our MUD and our DAC targets, um, and we're really proud of that, getting chargers in both multi-unit dwellings and disadvantaged communities. And um, we're more than halfway um, to activating all of those sites and getting them constructed. We'll move on to the next site. So I covered it briefly, but the we had a charge owner and a charge sponsor option. Um, so this is a little bit about, and it helps tell the story about why we um, blew, I guess, those numbers out of the water, our goals out of the water. So in order to incentivize adoption in both multi-unit dwellings and in disadvantaged communities, we had a tiered rebate system if the customer wanted to own the chargers themselves. And you can see financially the rebate was the largest for multi-unit dwellings in disadvantaged communities. Um, so folks were um, getting the largest financial incentives there and that certainly makes sense why we had a large adoption. On the other end of the spectrum, the way to see it is the workplaces outside of the disadvantaged communities have the smallest rebate. And then the bottom half of the page is if the customer chose the option for pg e to own and operate and maintain the charging equipment, um, they paid us a sponsor fee. Um, again, multi-unit dwellings and disadvantaged communities, the sponsor fee was zero dollars, again, incentivizing heavy adoption in that area. We'll move on to the next achievements I want to share with you, again, available on our Q1 report from 2020. Um, we monitored customer experience and satisfaction really closely, and we're really proud of um, what we've achieved in a few areas here. So we send a customer satisfaction survey to the program participants after um, their project's complete and they're activated. At this time, we had received survey responses from 30 customers and ranked us on a few areas. On likelihood to recommend, um, we have an average rating of 8.7 out of 10, 10 being good and high. Value to organization, a nine out of 10. That was a great thing to hear that customers not only are finding these charging stations um, useful, but certainly valuable to their organization. And then the overall process that it took to deploy the chargers, an 8.1 out of 10. So. Never perfect, but we're pretty proud of that. Um, and we're always focused on ways to improve and make it a better experience for our customers. We'll move on to, oh, sorry, a poll really quickly.
So it's important also not just to cite the chargers, but to have people use them. So um, wondering if you guys can get a good guess, like you did 88% right on the first poll question, the average spend per charging session for the EDCN program as of Q1 2020. Was the average charging session 32 minutes with $1.55, four hours, six minutes, eight hours, 14 minutes, or 11 hours and 43 minutes average charging session? You guys are so good. Two thirds got it right. Four hours and six minutes with an average cost of $2.43 is the right answer. You guys are good today. So this is um, a picture of our aggregate, aggregated load curve for Q1 2020. So we took all the individual sessions throughout the day, um, each day during Q1 2020, aggregated them and put them on this chart for you. So cumulative numbers are showing here. So less of an eye chart, um, I guess the, the picture of the curve um, is more important than seeing all of the numbers to me. Um, you can go see this again on the 2020 Q1 report on our website as well if you want to zoom in. The hours per day are on the x-axis from midnight all the way um, through the middle of the day there is when you see this spike and peak of charging um, down through the rest of the day. So this represents 14,595 charging sessions for an average duration is two thirds of you got right, four hours and six minutes, about 13 kilowatt hours average consumption per session and $2.43 average spend per charging session. So it's important for us, not only um, are the chargers just there, but also um, being used is certainly important to this program and to ED adoption as well. So I'll move on to learnings. That's um, what we want to share about today, not only our achievements, but what did we learn in this very unique um, first of its kind program. So three things I want to share with you all. There's lots of takeaways. I could have um, made this an hour presentation just on this alone, but three things I want to focus on. Um, that le lessons learned around stakeholder engagement, some solidarities and struggles, and then cost efficiencies. So stakeholder engagement was huge and very important for us. So some of, not an exhaustive list, but some of our stakeholders certainly are charge station vendors, community choice aggregators, local air management districts. We often partnered with them on rebates and incentives. The CPUC Energy Division we worked closely with um, about executing our program. The other IOUs, um, the other uh, utility operators in California we worked closely with that had similar CPU decisions they were working towards. Um, local agencies, customers of course seems like the obvious one, and then property owners was a big stakeholder here. So um, an, an example, um, an anecdote of the stakeholder engagement and why it was so important. Um, I can give examples for all of these, certainly partnering with um, other air management districts and local agencies and community choice aggregators was very important, but our charge station vendors were important in the success of this program, EV Box certainly one of them, in supporting our charge sponsor programs and really finding wins not only for our customers to put more money in their pocket, if the customers were looking to electrify and install chargers um, and, and then our charge station vendors seeking out those customers that were finding them first um, and then bringing them to us to charge in our program was a huge win. More money in the customer's pocket it was a perfect win for us to install those charging stations through our program and a win for the charge station vendors, absolutely. I'll move on to the pretty obvious stakeholder engagement here is customers, the market, the market demand. You can see here the numbers I showed you earlier are of the customers that we accepted into the program and will construct. These here are the numbers of who actually applied for 
the program. And the vast majority um, did not make it through to getting accepted into the program. We had to close our application portal in Q2 of 2019 because we had reached max capacity. So these numbers, again, it's the same data just sliced three different ways. We had eight, 817 applications at the time of closing in the application portal, which certainly demonstrated dramatic market demand um, for the program and for charging uh, installations and, and what that meant for um, our territory here. So we're really excited to see that and where that would go in the future. We'll talk about the next thing, uh, lesson learned for our EDCN program. Um, and this is a picture from the Rocky Mountain Institute. Um, this is, you can, I linked it here as well, but this, if you, if you just go on Google and search Rocky Mountain Institute uh, EV charging, this report will pull up. This is a report they published in December of 2019, and it talks about, they went out and researched from different utilities and uh, different stakeholders that had a piece of the EV charging infrastructure puzzle, and really the obvious ones that we knew going in were procurement and requirement constraints that we would have, but really what we were experiencing at pg and were the soft cost issues. So I've blown that part of the under the water line on, on this iceberg for us. So the soft cost things that we ran into were communication between utilities and providers, future proofing and what that meant. Easement processes were um, a huge thing for us at pg and and executing this program, as well as complex codes and permitting processes. We deal with hundreds of authorities having jurisdiction. Those are often called AHJs, um, the DSA, so lots of folks trying to figure this out for themselves. They never had quite the size and scale of an EV infrastructure program as we were executing here. So trying to work with um, all of those folks and certainly had major schedule impacts. So when Rocky Mountain Institute came out with this report in December of 2019, um, glad to see that other folks were experiencing this too and working through them and that we're paving the way for the future to kind of smooth out those rough edges going forward. And lastly, um, efficiencies that we gained and learned in this program. Keeps, keeps keep saying it over and over again. Nothing had been done to this size and scale before. So we had learned quite a bit early on in this program and through the agile method were continuous um, improvements all along the way. So we certainly had cost efficiencies here. I've shared with you again non-confidential that um, costs for what it costs us to install a charging cost report. Um, MUDs is the bar on the left and workplaces the bar on the right. Workplaces generally have more ADA constraints, which is why those are um, there. So another thing to point out, I wanted to share this picture with you. If you see the picture on the top with um, our pg e fleet vehicle nicely charging in one of our very first uh, EV installations, the EV infrastructure equipment you can see to the right of that picture is left to right, a distribution breaker panel, a step down transformer and a meter panel. And this wasn't really um, appealing to the eye. Um, customers weren't generally super excited to see those three. So we made proprietary equipment that boxed all three of those together and that's the picture inset in the lower right um, are all those three um, Put together. We consider that a, a win. It was a new way for us to design the infrastructure. Customers were much happier seeing um, that aesthetic look instead of the three together. So a win-win all the way um, and really demonstrated our ability to, to pivot, listen to our customers, and move forward. So with that said, I'm going to pass it over to Sam Piel, who is going to share about our ED Fast Charge program. Thank you. Thanks, Meredith, and thanks, EV Box, Diana, for hosting us today. Um, as Meredith mentioned, I'm going to be talking about our EV Fast Charge program. The Fast Charge program was launched um, a full 18 months after our EVCN program, and so um, what I'm going to be talking about is not only how we implement the program, but how we applied the lessons learned over those 18 months to make the Fast Charge program what it is today. But first, I'm going to start with a poll. And the question is, dun, dun, dun. what is the minimum KW to be eligible as a fast charger under the pg e program? Is it 24 KW, 50 KW, 62.5 KW, or 100 KW?
And excellent, winning streak for this webinar. 50 kW is the correct answer. And one of the reasons that I thought this would be a, an interesting poll question is that um, there's a lot of jargon in the EV world. There's level one, there's level two, there's level three, there's superchargers. And um, if you go to the next slide, I'm gonna kind of go over some of the program requirements. And 50 kW, we like to talk about it as that number and not um, fast charging by itself or um, any variety of level three because these numbers can get complicated. So, and just different places are using them in different ways. So 50 kW is the minimum hardware requirement for the program. Meredith talked about our budget being $22.4 million. Um, in the grand scheme of things, we recognize this is a tremendous amount of money, but relative to our other EV programs, it's actually quite small. So we call it small but mighty. And why is that? Well, the fast charge program is, um, requires public availability 24 seven, and it's for light duty vehicles. So while our EVCN program is, you know, targeting folks that have access to workplace or home charging, there's an entire set of the population that doesn't have access to, to either of those. Or when you're going on a long distance trip and you wanna take your EV, you gotta, you gotta charge somewhere and most people don't wanna dwell for four hours in order to, to recharge their car. So that's really the need that this program is trying to fit. We, similar to our other programs, have a target of 25% of our sites being located in disadvantaged communities. We also have a concept of DAC adjacent. And what that means is, um, the, the logic here is that just because a site is not specifically in a DAC, if it's adjacent to the DAC, which we define as a half mile around a DAC census tract, it's still gonna benefit that community. The air emissions, are <laughs> they, don't, they don't follow strict lines. So um, we've, the, we've got a little bit of an expanded definition there to serve. We also are trying to future-proof our sites. So what that means is just because the technology today is only able, not only able to, mo the most chargers today that we're seeing come into the program are at the 50 kW level. This technology is extremely nascent, so we expect that as time evolves, customers are gonna be interested in swapping out their charger and putting in a faster, fast charger. So what we're doing is building the make ready infrastructure to accommodate up to 150 kW so that in the future, we're not going back and retrenching to, to make fat or conduit, it's all in the ground up front. And with this budget, we hope to be able to install at approximately 52 sites, which should translate to about 234 ports. These are all very rough estimates. The program, as I mentioned, just launched last summer, and we are just beginning our final design for our first sites currently. Caitlin, if you could go to the next slide. So this image really, it's, and it's illustrating what the program is really doing. And Meredith talked about how we describe the make ready infrastructure going from the pole to the parking space. And so if you look at the slide, it fills in those pieces for you. You've got the utility pole on the left hand side, going to the transformer, to the meter panel. Usually utility work, we stop at the meter and it's the customer takes care of everything behind the meter. But for uh, our fast charge program, we are also covering all of the cost of construction and conduit, et cetera, all the way up to the charger itself. And then it's up to the charger, um, the site host or the EVSE owner to pay for the upfront and ongoing costs of the charger itself. Now, part of why this program is so important is that all of this infrastructure costs a lot of money, both the maker of the infrastructure and the charger itself. So while we are um, paying for the vast majority of the cost, the charger, given that uh, fast chargers generally cost upwards of $20,000, they are, we're still expecting the customer to take on a pretty hefty investment. 
we do have a rebate for customers in disadvantaged communities of up to $25,000 per charger. In some cases, this can come close to covering the entire cost for ownership um, and operation, but um, it really depends. There's a vast uh, variety of, of chargers and different kinds of hardware and, and EVSP services out there. Um, let's move on. So now I'm gonna go into some of the details of how we implement it. And this is where I'm gonna be going more into the lessons learned with the implementation. <clears throat> Excuse me. So lesson number one, all sites are not created equally. What this is getting at is the fact of what Meredith was talking about, both the hard costs and the soft costs with uh, sites that we constructed in EVCN. So from a hard cost perspective, the same two chargers going into a site and onto one site can cost dramatically different from two chargers going onto another site. And that has to do with the fact that the make ready piece of this is all related to construction and construction, the costs vary. It can vary based on the distance that you need to trench between the transformer and the meter. It can it can vary because of ADA costs, so the Americans with Disabilities Act. All of our sites are kept up to code, and we often find applicants that haven't, you know, they're, they're either currently out of compliance or it would take a lot of additional construction to bring them up to code. And so rather than taking customers on a first come, first serve basis, which is what we did with EVCN, we decided that in order to make this $22.4 million really go as far as we could take it. We wanted to be selective and really take the best sites that we could get. And so what you're seeing here is our application funnel. The way that we work the program is we've had solicitations for sites. So what happens is there's a solicitation window and the first step in that solicitation is getting a paper application. The paper application is pretty thorough. We're asking for site characteristics to understand things like, um, like I was mentioning about distance to trench between the transform and the meter. We're asking about the customer preference. Where do they want the chargers to go? You know, some retailers would love to have their chargers right at the front door and some retailers are saying, eh, we don't want it to block our, our, our front door. So we're working with customers to make sure that their needs are also met. Um, we are also looking at, on the paper application, things like the amenities on the site. Uh, we wanna make sure that customers or drivers out there are gonna wanna charge at these spots. So if we have our program and our, the, the PG&E fast chargers are all in just lousy locations, they won't get used. And that is critical to the success of the program overall is getting utilization. So we are looking at are there amenities nearby? Are there restaurants? Are there places to spend the 30 minutes that you're gonna be waiting while your car charges? And is it safe? Is the, you know, if something's not open, but for a couple hours a day, are there, is there gonna be enough foot traffic to help a driver feel safe while they're charging there? So all of this is getting looked at in the paper application. We have a scorecard and score all of the paper applications against that scorecard. And then the top scoring sites move onto a phone screen. In the phone screen, we're talking to all of the key stakeholders. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this later, but we're making sure that everybody involved knows what is the program about? What do we pay for? What do we not pay for? And what can you expect in this program? We don't want to uh, overpromise and under deliver essentially. After the phone screen, if everything checks out, we then moved on to a site walk. And the site walk is actually a pretty big investment for PG&E because we're mobilizing a handful of our staff and contractors to go out and meet with the customer on site to look at the setup. And we're verifying everything that we saw in the paper application. Does it line up with what we're seeing on site? So we're opening up the transformer boxes and saying, oh, is there enough space in here to fit additional conduit? Um, is it constructible? Like sometimes there's just not enough space to cram in all of this equipment. So um, that's what happens on the site walk. And resulting from the site walk, we're able to get a much more fine, 
fine view of what the site will actually cost to construct. So then the last step is the selection where we are taking all of the inputs we have to date and specifically the cost and we assess and see is this going to be a good fit both qualitatively and quantitatively for the program and from there we offer a contract. Um, another feature of this that we are kind of in the in the midst of right now is figuring out well when a, when a site doesn't isn't a good fit how do we enable the EVSP community how do we help our customers to move forward and find out like well what can we do what are our options in the future so we are also committed to providing feedback to all EVSPs with applications that are either not selected or waitlisted and the goal here is we you know we want to be moving the market if pg and &E can't help you there's other opportunities out there we want to help educate and make more opportunities for EVSEs to go out there um, into our service territory and the world, to be quite honest. So um, thank you. The next lesson that I'm going to talk about is engaging with stakeholders early. But to get to that point, I'm going to walk us through kind of end to end what the what the process looks like for a customer. So um, the first two boxes, application and siting and the eligibility assessment are what I just talked about. The paper application and then assessing if, if it's going to be a good fit for the program. After we assess that it's a good fit for the program, we offer a contract and then it moves into final design. And the final design, this takes usually a minimum of three months. And this is where we really, um, the utility really starts to make major investments in the site. So we are getting all of the paperwork to go to permitting. We're doing very detailed designs and layouts and of course getting an easement. All of this stuff leads up to construction. Construction generally takes one to two months. We do our best to keep it as uh, streamlined and uh, out of the way for customers as possible. Um, we do often have to have a, a clearance, meaning that the power has to get cut for a specific period of time. And we work closely with customers to figure out what, what that window of time will be. Um, there's lots of examples of that, specifically actually with COVID that we can talk about later, um, about timing clearances to make sure that things are gonna be as minimally impactful as possible. And then finally, after all the make ready construction is completed, we stub out the conduit and the site can be activated. And in this phase is where the charger is actually physically getting installed and all the provisioning happens, all the software setup is happening. And this is, this is the customer's responsibility, but we also do a lot of coordination to make sure it happens as closely to the time of construction being completed as possible. And then finally, utilization. The fast charge program has a term of five years in which it is up to the customer to um, maintain the charger in a usable state. Uh, this is kind of the key to our contract. If a customer is not able to own and operate that charger for the full five-year term and keep it up and running, um, we do then basically prorate back the costs of the make ready that we have invested in. So why is it important to engage stakeholders early? Well, if you look at these boxes, one through six. Boxes one and two, they take about usually on one to three months of time. And in terms of investment, it's, a, it's pretty much like it's an investment, but it's nowhere near the level of costs and investment that we start seeing when we get to, to step three. So what we do in both the application and siting phase and the eligibility assessment is make sure that we have the property owner and the site host and the EDSE owner and anybody else who might be a decision maker related to the project in the loop on the phone to make sure that there's not gonna be a surprise later. One of the lessons learned, I'm checking my time here, um, is related to easements. We have found that site hosts and specifically with retail spaces are not often, often not the same as the property owner. So, while most property owners see an investment in ED infrastructure as like 
two thumbs up for their site, it's going to increase the value of their property. You never know, and we really want to avoid getting into a situation downstream where we've done all this work and a project is a no-go because of a utility easement being required. And finally, our last lesson learned that I'm going to talk about today is leveraging existing relationships. And uh, don't go on Twitter for this hashtag of everyone wins. I just made it up. But basically, one of the things we learned with our EVCN program was that uptake can be slow, even when we're giving away what we think is a really valuable service. Customers don't necessarily latch onto it right away. And what we found is that actually our partnerships with EV service providers, they have the same motivation as us. They want to put chargers in the ground at cost effective sites where customers want them. So what we did for the fast charge program was rather than asking a customer to apply on their own and submit an application on their own, we, we've directed customers to work with a qualified EVSP in order to submit the application. What this does for us is it improves the quality of our applications because in general, EVSPs are, um, they've got a bit of a skill set in-house to look at a site and take a swag at, oh, is this site gonna be feasible? Is there going to be um, a, a enough space in the parking lot to, to put the chargers? Um, and they're also able to just provide a lot more detail that we use in our evaluation process in order to evaluate the application. So um, that's one way that we've been able to leverage our relationships with EVSPs. In addition, it's also helped us to reduce program overhead. So, um, you know, most utility programs have a, have a budget set aside for marketing, education, and outreach. And we have spent very little of that for this program, which means that we've got more money to spend on actual construction of sites because we haven't mobilized any of our own uh, workforce to try and sell the program. We've been able to position the program as a tool to help EVSPs sell their product. And then finally, we hope that it's going to lead to a more streamlined customer experience. Um, it can get tricky when you're talking to multiple points of contact. So we try to leave the EVSP as the main point of contact for the customer, and they are available to answer all of the questions that customers tend to have about what can be a fairly complicated process of installing, um, installing charging equipment on your site. So uh, we are happy to say that we've evolved and the program is still very early, so we'll see how, we'll see how this ends up shaking out. Um, so again, I think I've captured the hard costs, the soft costs, and the uh, importance of stakeholder relationships with this last lesson learned. And with that, um, I'm going to, yeah, pass it back to Diana to take us through some discussion. Thank you, Sam, and thank you, Meredith, for the presentations. I think it's given us a great background to start our discussion and our questions and answering. Um, and audience participation will be through us pulling questions that you have in the Q&A portion of the, of the, pres of the uh, platform here. So if, you, if the audience has questions, please go ahead and load up those now. Uh, to kick it off, though, I've, I've got a question for, I think, starting with Meredith. Um, so we can kind of get in some additional information. With so many applicants um, with the EVCN program, how did uh, pg and &E decide who to select? Was it, this is on the EVCN, um, was it on a first come basis? Um, and I think we've touched a little bit about utilization in the uh, EV Fast Charge program, but on the EVCN side, was utilization actually considered um, as to which sites were selected? And did the criteria actually change as the program evolved? If you could maybe share a little insights on that, Meredith. Sure, yeah, thank you, great questions. Um, it was mostly first come first serve basis for our EVCN program. We did uh, very similar to the inverse triangle pyramid that Sam showed you. We had a very similar process for applicants in the program and then screening our applicants. So we were looking for things like um, proximity to a transformer. We know 
you saw the cost slide earlier too. We know that one of the, the most costly components to installing the EV charger infrastructure is feet of trenching. And so we learned pretty early on that we needed to stay close to transformers. So we would work closely with customers to identify transformers that had capacity um, and that were, were within less than 200 feet of a transformer. And then from there, um, it was pretty fair game. So um, we would do much like Sam talked about for the fast charge program, we would go out and do site walks and make sure that there weren't any other red flags or barriers that we couldn't overcome. So I would say largely first come first serve. Um, and then we'd work through customers, same contract um, that we have for a lot of other programs. We'd work with customers to make sure that they agreed to our program. If they didn't own the property, sometimes easements were, were a hurdle. Um, so I guess there were a few few opportunities when a customer would self-select out of the program um, because they couldn't agree with either some things in the terms and conditions or the easements um, themselves or some other factors in terms of number of charging stations was also a big factor for us. It was a minimum of 10. We usually saw about 15 charging stations per site. So customers who were looking for less than that generally were um, self-selected out of the program as well. Okay, so it does sound like that at first it was sort of first come, first serve, but then as you got into the program, you started to recognize the, that there was expensive sites and less expensive sites. So the cost of the implement of the installation also started to factor into that decision making. Yes, exactly. And we got one of the Q and A questions we got um, as I was scrolling through was who pays for this? So this is these are ratepayer funds, and so as a judicious response fiduciary responsibility in using these rate pair funds. It's not a blank check program. Um, we couldn't build the charger, you know, far out in the corner of the parking lot because that's where the CEO likes to charge her Tesla kind of a thing. Um, we couldn't do all everything in every all the bells and whistles. So we had to put some parameters around what, what we thought was a judicious way to spend our budget, which was finite, to achieve the goal, 7,500 um, charging stations, or at least attempt to achieve that. Um, and so if you, if you spend the blank check and build it way out in the corner in the shady spot, um, that doesn't always work out. You can see in your lovely background behind you is a picture of our Bishop Ranch offices. There you go. And those are EV box chargers at um, PG&E is located there, but other several other companies are in those buildings as well. Um, same thing. We looked at the proximity to a, the, um, I know the transformer is immediately to the right behind you, kind of behind that white pickup truck. And so the sighting for that, those particular chargers and that's representative of other locations um, was the best use of funds, the shortest distance um, for our program. Yep. So just to tie off of that, because there was another question, is what are the, are there explanations for why you didn't, or I don't think you're going to be able to achieve the 7,500 installations? Is that because of cost creep or were there other factors that ended up affecting your ability to maximize the number of ports? Yeah, I think there are a few factors there. Um, certainly this program was new and revolutionary in a lot of ways. And so there was uh, a little bit of unknown and guessing for how to in do this program, what we thought we could achieve for the budget um, and the what we could install. Um, and so we made a good educated guess at the get-go um, without having to having done a program like this before. There was a little bit of um, education right at the beginning, things that we maybe hadn't planned for. Um, there were also some environmental factors that happened in California that put cost constraints on market cost resources that we didn't have a lot of control over. Um, and so that inflated costs where we didn't quite expect. Um, and so achieving just shy of 5,000 ports of the original up to 7,500 is what our um, goal was. Certainly cost was the major um, impact there. Uh, we would have hired more people and constructed all 7,500 if we could have um, had the budget to do so. Makes sense, thank you. Um, all right, now over to Sam. Um, similar kind of question and you did touch on some of it but I do wanna give you a chance to add a little more color here. Uh, does PG&E require a business case for applicants in the DCFC program? Does the site need to demonstrate enough, enough electrical demand to justify the installation? If so, what are the requirements? That's a great question. So we don't require a business case. 
However, um, we think that if a customer is, they've got skin in the game with this program, no matter what. And so in most cases, there, there does need to be a business case because why else would you want to do it? So, um, you know, one kind of example business case that we've heard is, um, you know, we're a gas station. Gas is going to be, no one's going to put gas in their cars in, we hope, 20, 20, 30 years from now. We own this land. What are we going to do to stay relevant? So that's a typical business case. Um, maybe we can sell more soft drinks at our convenience store if we have more customers coming in. Um, so we, don't, we pg and &E don't require a business case, but we think that most customers will want to have one in order to justify their own decision to do it. Um, in terms of a minimum demand, we also don't require a minimum demand, but kind of the flip side of that is we are looking at utilization. So I touched on how we don't want to have um, conduit in the ground that can carry 50 kW of charge and um, get 10 kWh a month. That's not good for customers. It's not good for the site hosts, and it's certainly not good for the program. So we are looking at ways of guessing at utilization, which utilization will correlate with demand um, on the site in order to kind of go through the selection process. Now, we're seeing that the business case and that, that um, demand actually often align. So mm -hmm. um, the locations we're seeing, a lot of urban locations and highway corridors where people are applying. Um, as a follow up to that, um, I, I learned in the program or your presentation that you guys are doing infrastructure for a maximum of 150 kilowatts um, with this with this program. So it's kind of sandwiched between, um, you know, the EVCN and, you know, just like supercharging, right, with like the 350 kilowatt, which may be more of the, the fleet program. Is that where you guys are? are uh, not necessarily, right? You're right. There's also yeah. small fleets, but is pg and &E going to address at some point, um, you know, like the supercharging type of uh, segment that is coming down the road as, you know, improvements to technology and vehicles being able to actually absorb that much electricity? Can you give us a little insight into, sure. into that? Sure, absolutely. So this is kind of getting back to one of that, those first points I made about the jargon in the industry. So one of the very common questions that we get is, oh, Fast charging, is that like a Tesla supercharger? And the simple answer is yes, it is. It's a, it's a spot that you can charge your car and do it relatively quickly. On any given site, a Tesla site or a PG&E install, it's, there's a lot of variables that go into the actual speed at which the car is charging. The biggest single variable after a 50 kW charger might charge um, one car at 3 kW, and it might charge another car at 50 kW. And the reason for that is that the car itself is, the, is at today the biggest limiting factor of how much draw you'll get from the charger. Um, there's debate about what fast charging does to a battery. So um, most, if you read your owner's manual on your EV, it'll often say, if you have a choice, don't use a fast charger, use your, use your home charger. Um, now that said, it's not, it's not voiding the warranty. So, um, so your first point about um, how do we address the, you know, supercharger versus fast chargers. Um, I think what my, my response to that is bigger is not necessarily better today. Um, I drive a 2012 Nissan Leaf and it gets, it does everything I need it to do, but my car is the one that if I plug it into a fast charger, it's only going to take three kW. And so it's not a great fit for me today. Um, now there's so much more I could say about that. I'm going to stop right there with that. The other piece of that, um, we didn't talk about our fleet program today, but, um, certainly buses and trucks that are coming and have a huge impact on GHD emissions 
that is, it's a tough nut to crack. It's not something we're addressing with our fast charge program because the fast charge program is specifically for light duty vehicles, which Very is good. like passenger cars like yours and mine. Mm -hmm. We do have the fleet program and that should probably have its whole, it's, its own webinar. And part of what makes that a tough nut to crack is all the permutations of buses and trucks and forklifts. And some of them, you know, you can use a fast charger on some vehicle and some heavy duty vehicles, but not others. And so there's just a lot of permutations there to work through. And um, it, it's, a, it's a specialty. <laughs> so um, I hope I addressed that, that you question. Did, you did, there's just, uh, it's, it, there's one piece of the puzzle that we didn't talk about today, which is actually the fleet program, I think. And maybe we'll have another webinar down the, down the road to kind of dig into that a little bit more. Um, we have a couple minutes less. I think I'm going to pick one more question from the audience. Um, uh, let's see, real quick. Um, where did the funds come from? We already got that one. Um, are there more funds coming for the EVCN program? We would like more funds coming. <laughs> yeah, cross your fingers. Um, the initial EVCN program was a pilot program. I failed to address that in this presentation. So it was a pilot program really demonstrating both the, the market demand was there um, and that, that we as a utility company could scale up and prove that we could support the demand in the market for EBCN programs. So we certainly um, intend to work with the CPUC and the energy division to make this um, a larger scale program in the future. Um, would love to see that at this point. We're still waiting um, for the right time to ask for that and to work with the energy division. So certainly I think we've both demonstrated both there's market demand for this program as well as the utility um, ability to support the infrastructure rollout. So we certainly hate, hope to, to do this 10x of what we achieved in our EDCM program. Terrific. Okay, well, I want to thank the panelists, both you guys, for working with us to present this information to the market. Um, one, I was a pleasure doing the, this with you, and I'm sure the audience appreciates the information that was, was shared and disseminated. Um, so thank you both. And I'd like to hand this off to a final um, wrap up for, with uh, Caitlin. Thank you, Diana, and thank you to all of our speakers. Um, for everyone, here is the contact information of our speakers today. Please do not hesitate to reach out to them. Um, this information will also be provided in the follow-up email shortly. Um, with this, also thank you for attending this webinar. I really hope that you learned a lot, because I know I definitely have. Um, soon you will be receiving a follow-up email with the evaluation form and the contact information. Um, in addition to this, early next week, you'll receive another email with the recording to this webinar. Uh, finally, our next EV Box webinars will be on August 12th, discussing EV charging and battery storage. You can already pre-register for this event. I think the link will be shared now in the chat function. So if you already want to have a look and pre-register, I recommend that you do. Um, and after you register, of course, don't forget to add it to your calendar. And thank you for your time. We hope to see you at our next webinar and have a great day.